respect you. <laughs> All right. We're here at the Better Days Joint Revolution show at Black Art America Gallery. It's print and print processes that we talk about. Got my man Farron Manuel here, Black Art America Foundation in the house. Just going through, checking out the work, because it just got hung up. It looks great. It's amazing. Got so many different uh, master artists, so many different techniques, so many different processes. And we just want to introduce y'all to a little bit of what we got going on here together. Farron, what's your first thoughts about the show, man? Uh, it's it's a like a deep dive into into the printmaking processes and also some experimental stuff. So I'm I'm excited to hear more about you know the approaches that you know Jamal takes as a printmaker and how his how his peers are approaching the world. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for welcome. Y'all taking off? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, nice you and everything. And yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate everything. I appreciate you. Place. We'll be back. With the yes, come back. Of we got the artist talk reception on July 15th. Okay. Uh, so okay. Saturday from like 2 to 4. So we'll be here. Come back and be a part of that. It'll be good stuff. Okay. okay. Be wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you. So first, this side, I'm part of the wall. We got Chloe Alexander, a great printmaker here in Atlanta. Uh, teaches at high school, teaches high school art, but also does these fantastic prints. Been doing residencies. Uh, she's out in California right now doing residency. So she does all types of stuff. A lot of her work is centered around her family. And a lot of what you see, like these are her kids and most of the pictures that you see. Uh, because they're always there, as she said. <laughs> but she, you know, a lot, a lot of strong emotional resonance in a lot of her work. And so she's an expert in this kind of screen printing technique. Uh, you know a little bit about screen printing. It's just like having a window screen, right? But you put this photo in motion on it, and so part of it can go in and out. Uh, it depends on how you expose it to light. So when you print it, you can mass produce it. So a lot of printmaking, printmaking is about mass production. Like that's the that's biggest thing about it. When you're doing a painting or a collage, it's only one of them, but the process of themselves make it possible to do multiples of the image. So that's when you get into multiple uh, instances of a thing, but also multiple prints in terms of additions. So this edition, this is an AP of this particular thing. This might be sold out, I'm not say that. But beautiful work where she hands draws a lot of the screens. And then it creates the screen prints and all these like color fields of a lot of fantastic gradients and uh, iridescent stuff inside of it. Lot of stuff. All right, so I'm back. I'm back recording. All right, and so if you can tell us a bit about about this block. Oh yeah, so in another print process is relief, and you'll see a lot more of that in the show. Uh, but relief process: you take a piece of wood, you carve into it ink it and then you can get prints off of that. And so you'll see a lot of examples of that like further in the show, but this is the actual block that was carved, the wood itself that was used in the process. So you can see, if you come in, you can see all the different marks that's inside of here, the tool marks, all the different cuts that she made inside of it. So it's a lot of planning, but a lot of like knowing your tools and knowing what size mark, what tools give you what kind of mark and how to use it and what kind of repetition because you get a lot of this like rhythm pattern inside of the folds of this and the different tool marks you use on the hands to differentiate fabric from human skin, like all this kind of stuff that goes into it. This is a really great block. I saw this in the corner of her studio. It's like, nah, that's, that's it right there. Like, what's, <laughs> what's that over there against the wall? So it's a uh, great piece to have in the show. So here we got Rashawn Rucker, artist out of Detroit. Uh, this one man, Rashawn, he's known a lot for his graphite drawings, but he's a great printmaker. And his printmaking technique, if you notice the difference between like these two, is he usually used like a big, a larger wood tool to cut everything. Mm -hmm. And so all of his marks are like a lot wider mm -hmm. and it feels a lot more gestural than something like this that feels much more intricate more time consuming so it's he's sacrificing, sacrificing it, but he's having a different kind of mark because of the tools that he's using but he does a lot of this southern imagery a lot of stuff about family uh, we talk a lot so it's about 
Uh, he, we talked a lot about growing up in North Carolina, hanging out with his granddad and his moms and kind of all this kind of family, church, Southern life that we get into a lot. Uh, he talks about a lot of that kind of stuff. So he, particularly around his faces, I really love him, how he does his faces. You know, he really cut the matting as, yeah, a, as a church the matting, yeah. like architecture to it. Yeah, and this was a great idea. I wish I thought of this when I did my, <laughs> did my prayer. This is a great idea. And even here, like he uh, usually, because he carves really fast, uh, and so you can see a lot of the gestural marks inside of it. But this one, he started adding the second color to a lot of his prints, and I think that makes it separate a lot more. You can use that as point emphasis mm -hmm. because now you're looking at the white shirt is so much different than everything else, so it's drawing your attention. So a lot of it is about composing, controlling people's attention as they move through pieces. Again, this is relief too. So these were all wood. These were lino cuts. So linoleum and wood basically give you the same thing. It's just about a different kind of material where wood is much harder. Linoleum is kind of like a rubber type material uh, that can be carved, but it gives you nice straight edges. It's cheap. It's affordable. So you know. And as far as material, looking at linoleum versus wood, how is it as an artist, you know, making your mark? the two, how does it differ? So wood has its own characteristics. It's natural, so you have the wood grain. So it matters what direction you're carving, like when you set it up. It matters uh, because a wood cut's often gonna be more rough because the wood itself chips away like at the end of your cuts a lot of time. You can't control it. That's just functionally what's gonna happen because it's wood. Uh, you can't control it. For me, that's the characteristic, so wood, cuts are a little bit rougher around the edges usually when you look at it. But linoleum is like rubber. So as soon as you cut it, it's cut clean, it's precise, so you're always gonna have a clean mark. So to me, I can tell the difference uh, based on materials off that. Okay. And let's, let's get into to your work. Yeah, yeah, so this is my part of the show. Uh, and I, I chose to show a couple of different things. Um, still a lot of wood cuts because that's kind of my main uh, printmaking technique is wood cuts. That's just what I do. I, I like it. That's how I think about stuff. I just, you know, can't avoid it. So this piece I was actually printed for me at uh, University of Southern Indiana uh, in collaboration with their uh, advanced level printmaking classes. So this is actually screen print layers of flowers and leaves behind and the wood cut that I carved printed on top. So there's probably one, two, three, four, five or six different layers of color and then the block of the line cut printed on top of it. And so I like that kind of kind of technique. And this edition is 42 of them. Okay. And so you're mixing and so matching you, approaches. Yeah, so in this one in particular. Uh, it's two separate processes because I like to, because of you're dealing with multiples, there's room for each multiple to be something different, but they still all relate. So if you use the same screens, the same colors, uh, but they might be layered different. So all of 42 prints, all the patterns in the back are different because okay. some of them might have more red, some of them might have more green, some of them are darker, some of them might use colors that are not in the other ones, but it's the same screens. And so the background environment is different. So all 42 of them are different impressions of the same print. Does that make sense? It makes sense. So they have different feels all of them when you look at them. So it's a varied edition, but it's 42 of those. So if you don't know about editions, right? Editions are usually at the bottom corner of any print that you have. And if you look at the number, it's usually a fraction. So the top number is you know, you have two different numbers. The bottom numbers tell you overall how many prints of this is in the edition. Artists are really making a deal with the clientele when they say, if this number is 42, there are only 42 of these prints ever going to exist. I'm not going to make no more. I'm not going to cheat you. I'm not going to have 50 of them, sell 50 of them when I say it's 42. And I'm like that. This is between me and you, what you're buying is the value of it. And so this is the 17th one out of the 42. And that's all that ever going to be of any of those. So this is 42, which is pretty high for me. 
but somebody else printed it, so it didn't, <laughs> it didn't bother me. Right. But you have people like Ruck, when you look at his editions, it's one of two, this one is four of four, uh, so he keeps his editions very low. So that means they're rare, right? There's right. not that many of them that exist in the first place. So that's the, the thing about editions. What's next? Let's get into this, uh, you know, this large block. Yeah, this, this one here, I love carving big stuff. And so we have an event down at the print studio called Print Big, where we have uh, these big blocks that they print with a steamroller uh, to make prints. It's a, it's, a, it's a good time, and there's really no reasonable way to print something this size, right? right. This, something this size, you either have to have a huge press, or you gotta use a steamroller, or you can print it by hand, which is, if you can imagine, Take, <laughs> yeah, it takes all day to try to print one of these by hand, but you know that's the that's what we do. So this was printed in with a steamroller. Who's uh, driving this? Who's driving the steamroller? I'm driving the steamroller. Okay. Yeah, there's videos of me, you know, making it happen. You gotta do what you gotta do to make this art, man. That's what I say. So this carving, um, it took me, it took me longer to design it than it took me to carve it. I carved it, carved it in about three days, all put together. You know, taking breaks and stuff like that. It wasn't like an all-day affair either. But I carved very fast too. And part of it in the design is just part of it is really intricate and detailed, like the like the more realistic faces that you see. Those are pretty set in, in design. But a lot of this other stuff is about movement and emotion, and so that kind of stuff goes a lot faster when I carve it personally because I can think about and look at the block and tell, what does this space need? Yeah. Like maybe like it's too quiet in certain moments, so maybe let's break it up with um, a bit of, a couple of flowers that go in behind, go, to go in and out. That creates a little bit of sense of depth when you look at it too. And so yes, it's a flat image, but it has realistic figures, but it's going in and out of abstraction the whole time. And for this piece, Council of Women. A uh, Council of Women. Council of Women. What, what was the inspiration for this piece? So I did a, a piece a few years ago that was not quite this big. It might have been four foot. This is a seven foot block. And it was about the council. So I was telling a story about how we communicate and learn and interact in blackness. And so that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a one-to-one -one thing. You don't read it in a book. You kind of learn it through the witness of other black people. And so when I'm talking to you, I'm telling you a story that I may have got from my granddaddy, from my neighbor. He may have got that story from somebody else. So all these like continuations of blackness of how we add up to what we get as the sense of what it means to be black. But it, they were all men. So I always wanted to do a version that was all women because they do the same thing. And they talk and they think about their grandmothers and their aunties and and their friends and all these other people. So all these other people go in and out of the conversation. It's never just us talking. Right. Like it's the generations of us that have been around discussing what blackness is. So you can see, so I, I, really I make people guess how their faces is in it. But this is like through time. <laughs> this is through time. Well, it's, a, it's an insinuation of time because okay. we don't know where generation each other people are from. So it could be from anywhere, but I make people guess how many faces are in it. You can see clearly the three faces, but there's seven faces in the whole picture. And that's what I mean, they go in and out of the abstraction and feed into each other. So the conversation is happening, is happening on a much bigger, more ancestral, spiritual kind of level than anything else. It's going to be Rusha. Now, printmaking on fabric, is there um, a difference in, is there like a difficulty to it as opposed to paper or? I, I don't, it's not a difficulty, it's just different. Okay. Right, because if you take, uh, once you have your block, you can print on, once you have your block or matrix, which is the wood that was carved, you can really print on anything. Like you can print on fabric, on canvas, on paper, on other pieces of wood. Um, you know, all sorts of things. Anything that can accept whatever kind of ink it is that you're going to use, you can do it. 
Uh, fabric is fairly simple because the same way we do these t-shirts. These t-shirts are screen printed industrially, but in, in, in simple terms, it's the exact same process that Chloe was using to be able to do it that makes these t-shirts. So it, it's essentially the same process. I, I included this in the show I wanted to because I want to emphasize the multiple that people are looking at. Right? Okay. It's the idea that yes, like each individual print, just like all of these, this will be almost considered an addition of a print, even though it's four different prints. Right? So you can see the same figure how it's set up and give you the ability to envision it on a different color. And then each color gives you a different feel of the piece overall. And so you get a real sense of it, like when you see these kind of inner group of exactly what the work is involved, exactly how the medium can be pushed, exactly what each part of the print can introduce another variable that changes what was carved. So the same way, if you can change the color of the fabric, you can change the fabric to paper. You can change the color of it. You can paint on it. You can change the color of the ink of the, of the piece that's printed. You can change the orientation of how it's printed. I can print two of these fingers on the top. So it just gives you like so many possibilities of what you can do with prints. Okay. I don't actually know what about these prints, about the problems for me. But I think these are screen prints, right? Yeah, she does uh, stencils and um, uh, screen print techniques. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I think these are. Yeah. It's the work of Robin Holder. And, uh, and in terms of uh, display of the show, you know, you have a part of it curated by Jamal that you just highlighted, but also you have uh, parts that were uh, curated by our, our team here at Black Art in America. So um, I put these two pieces uh, together on this wall, just looking at the color palette, um, subject matter, and I just thought it would be a good fit right next to Narisha's work. Uh, Robin Holder is, uh, you know, a printmaker that I, you know, I really enjoy her work, um, looking at it, and, you know, it just made a good fit for here, and it just tells a, a story. I figured this piece, you know, this woman looks very tranquil, and it fits this meditative uh, pose on the figure here and just made a really good uh, juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. And you're also getting to telling the story with multiple elements being printed over and over and over. So the repetition uh, is also being spoke about as well, as well as the color. So you can see the rabbit in here is a different color that's a little bit larger, but it's all being layered over with other stuff. Same thing with the horses being repeated in this one. Same thing with these kind of uh, intricate kind of shapes being repeated everywhere inside of the two. This is a really great layering technique for these. And if we come over here, we got some works by uh, Richard Mayhew, uh, you know, a really well known uh, landscape painter. So these are prints of a uh, seascape. And if you look at the um, the coloration, you know, one is done in the reverse of the other, giving this effect of, you know, movement when paired together, but even, you know, on their own, you have that sense of movement and it just kind of changes, uh, you know, with the two being paired together. As far as, um, as techniques, what would you, you know, highlight, you know, and, and get in the approach of oh, yeah. you know, so, shifting of the colors? Uh, this one is, uh, a straight printing of a copper plate, and this one is the reverse positive of it. So when you're doing with etching, um, the, but, how was that? the traditional word for it is intaglio. So intaglio means beneath the surface. And so if you have a piece of copper plate, you use an S acid or uh, some kind of twisted scribe or some kind of tool to make a mark inside of it. So this is about how you, process, how you apply the ink. Once you have the marks in the surface, with relief, you're inking up the top layer of it. So only the very tip top of what is left on your plate gets the ink, so it's relief. 
And taglia is beneath the surface, so in the ink goes into the marks that are inside, and then the surface is wiped clean and it's printed. That's how you get the etching. So uh, that's why you get your marks to look like pen marks, because all of these marks are from the tool or from you know acid resist, and then you break the surface, so you get these kind of uh, pen and ink type of marks inside of it. Uh, when you finish the copper plate, you can ink it regular way, traditionally, and print it like this. Or what you do is make a reverse positive, is that you ink the same copper plate as a relief block. And so the ink doesn't go into the line, so you get a reverse effect. So everything that was black here, inked in, is now white because it doesn't have the ink. And so now you got uh, the same plate, and you get two completely different prints out of it. It's a, they're great to have these prints together like this because you can really see the difference in the technique. I noticed it immediately in my side when I saw it because you just get the same sense of balance of lines, but the positive and negative has just been flipped. So we have a, a monoprint technique used here over uh, a wood block print, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, David Driscoll did a lot of this in his work. Uh, and he did a lot of layering, where even he would have uh, multiple blocks just being printed on each other. And they weren't necessarily designed to be printed on top of each other. They just ended up with like this really uh, elaborate interaction that happened when the two prints came together. So there's always a lot of that in it. And part of that is also you have a, the black on this one is relief, some kind of carbonate did. And the color underneath is actually monoprint. So monoprint, like you have an actual monoprint uh, plexi plate here, which I think is fascinating just as a material uh, to look at, because this is what you do. You take a piece of plexiglass and you paint on top of it with uh, oil-based inks or Akua inks, which are soy-based and they don't dry on the plate and then you can print them off onto another sheet of paper uh, in reverse. But that image itself looks a lot more like a painting than anything, which essentially is what it is. He made a painting onto the plexiglass and then printed it. When, if you have the proper design, which I think he did here, where you can see uh, it's reversed, so it's, you gotta kinda do the math on it. But you can see the face, you can see the flowers, you can see the sun shape right here. You can see like the kind of background for all the different leaf colors and stuff. So all of it is there. So he probably looked at the block, painted on the surface, and then printed it, knowing that this was going to be printed on top of it. Which explains the reverse. Yeah, which explains the reverse signature, because he probably signed the correct side, right? <laughs> but if he actually displayed it uh, properly, it wouldn't look like that. So I think this is brilliant material. This is amazing to be able to look at like this part of it. Here. And we got some um, some work by Robert Pruitt. So the original drawing on a plate here, and if you you know you look at it, it's on the reverse as we just noted mm -hmm. about the layering of the paper. So you know you're always in a sense you're always working backwards. Yeah. So what is what is that like as a as an artist, you know, creating images? I think you, you kind of take it as being inherent in the process. So it's not that I think about necessarily carbon in reverse, but I work with it knowing that it's going to be reversed, if that makes sense. Like it's not something I'm thinking about every single time I do it. But you you flip it the one time, especially when you do something like this, you're like, what direction do in the print do I want for the face? Then I flip it, and then I work the whole thing just in that same direction because the flipping it, it changes it slightly, but it doesn't change it uh, how you draw it. Like the way you draw a mouth is the way you draw a mouth. So whether it's facing left or right, you're gonna draw the mouth the same. This is gonna be produced with a certain direction, like in mind. So you probably don't even think about that part of it except right initially when you say, I want her to face left. Mm -hmm. Then I draw it the other way, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so this is uh, a lithography, uh, aluminum lithography, so using you know alchemy, alchemy with gum, everybody can 
um, grease pencils and like all kinds of different stuff. You'll draw it onto a piece of aluminum or this is a piece of... There's a cut here. There's a cut in it. How long, what is this material? I'm not quite sure. This might be some kind of uh, kitchen litho plate or something like that. <laughs> That cut is just a cancel. Yeah, the, the cut is a cancel the thing. But I was going to see if I could see how thick the material was and stuff. But it's some kind of plate. So you use um, certain drawing tools and gum arabic and stuff to set this part of it into whatever your plate surface is. And then you can use water and ink and ink it up and basically end up with your print. So this is, you know, have a much more, it looks like a drawing is what it looks like. Traditionally, lithography was a litho stone, limestone that's been treated, uh, honed to be like a nice even surface and you could use grease pencils and different uh, touche and like all kinds of other different materials to set whatever drawing was inside of it. But it gives you an impression of a drawing, charcoal drawing or something to that effect when you use it. by, well, they're one-offs by uh, Delita Martin. So, you know, traditional printmaking techniques, but also, you know, some with some collaging in of uh, pearls and a fabric and some embellishment here. And you also have, um, you know, text being inserted, but, you know, one of one, so original works using, um, you know, more traditional printmaking techniques. And, it's a, a rare piece from the artist. We wanted to frame these here to have a conversation about perspectives on black hair. There's another piece in the front of the show. Um, you know, it's uh, a printed and assembled box with a uh, creamy crack on it, making a reference to, um, to perm hair. So uh, just framing conversations about technique uh, in conversations about, you know, just social conventions, stereotypes, and perspectives, uh, you know, that, that are common in black life, and, you know, topics that, you know, that we, that we need to address as a community. So, you know, these are really great, uh, you know, pieces to, to facilitate that conversation. So just getting the artist, you know, a black woman's perspective, and um, her vision, you know, her self-image. And, you know, even, you know, with this, this natural wig piece, you know, it says this wig keeps undesirable hair covered. So it's, it's really a reverse on a social convention um, in the West about straight hair versus, or straight hair and uh, kinky hair, or, you know, more um, a tighter curl pattern. And these were created on a letterpress. So um, the way they used to print anything that you could think of back in the day in the 1900s, uh, late 1800s, they would use these machines that had each letter was individually set. So this B would be just a B on a block by itself, this L and another L. So you would pick out the type and literally set the type. Um, and then how it lined up would be printed. It's how they used to print newspapers. It's how they used to print books is how they used to print everything, somebody individually set and type. So this to me goes back to that same kind of effect uh, in the way that we disseminate information, D disseminate propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of propaganda because you can have government sponsored, you can have political stuff, but you also have something from the perspective of a black woman, like telling you about the messages and feelings that they have about their hair. So this entire series to me feels like that. And letterpress is a great way to do it because you create so many pieces that are meant to be disseminated amongst the community or somewhere as as, as advertising as uh, ways to push a, a particular opinion on the people, not on the people, but you you know it's just like anything you blanket the to area present with, a certain yeah you blanket the area with the movie posters because you want everybody to go see Spider Man you know what I'm saying like right. it's that type of thing and so this harkens back to that type of thing it recalls. Um, to me, Emory Douglas, who was the, the Black Panther uh, poses and stuff like that.
to a lot of this um, very strong messaging about black women's hair. The lead is great at that too. So in this in this space, I wanted to to uh, frame a conversation about uh, you know black notions of Americana or um, you know just uh, just themes of American life that are more uh, connected to the black experience. So we have this uh, you play by Alfred Conte, and you have these two brothers, uh, Evan and Aaron, and you know they're decked out in red, white, and blue. So he put that blue uh, skin tone to them, and they have the red and white, um, you know, wardrobe. And the thing about Alfred playing with these colors, it can kind of get uh, lost on you how realistic, you know, the, the figures are as far as like the uh, the folds in their shirts and. How, how natural and, and real these figures look. And, you know, he has his, his constant, uh, you know, rusted patina in the back, and he's even gone in and started to change the color of, of rust in his work also. And we paired these with these unframed posters, um, you know, on an American flag theme. This one, uh, signed by Faith Ringo. And Dr. Carolyn Mazzalomi. On and the Dr. Carolyn Mazzalomi here. And, you know, really just thinking about the concepts of uh, reproduction, uh, the concept of uh, the valuation of a reproduced image. And, you know, you have the G. Clay here. You have a poster here. And, you know, you also have a more traditional uh, print here by Robert Colescott, who also engages these conversations about stereotypes and, um, and problems in black life, but he does it with a more humorous uh, lens and approach to it. So, you know, he has the I can't dance, you know, which harkens the all black people can dance uh, stereotype that I don't really fit into, but <laughs> which is why I resonate with this piece. And, you know, you also have uh, world champ. So I'm thinking, uh, you know, world in the sense of dancing. And you have the dancing feet here on both pieces. And it looks like, you know, this woman in the center here is uh, subconscious about, you know, people figuring out that she can't dance or wondering why she's a, a wallflower. And in this piece, you have the dancing feet here. And you also have the American uh, flag uh, aesthetic here with the stars. So it just, you know, just given subject matter and, you know, image-wise, it just made a really good fit for this wall. I think it also relates in terms of what we hit on with the leader's piece is the idea of propaganda. And whenever you see text in a written work, you're also thinking about what is the text communicating? The communication, the message, equals propaganda, like when you have it. So a lot of different ways to look at it, because even Alfred is talking about propaganda by using the red, white, and blue and these flags to present his people the same way like these pieces are used in disseminating information uh, about America. So it's an interesting little grouping with these and the leaders that are in this kind of conversation because even including the text in this lithograph uh, right here is, is really interesting too. How, you know, little bits of pieces of it relate. And also not to, not to get lost on G. Clay as a form of uh, reproduction printmaking. It's not necessarily traditional printmaking in that sense, but it is a way to create the re reproductions of particular images. And there's a lot, all sorts of things you can do with it, because I know we've seen people like Curly Holton that have done, have used some form of, of digital reproduction and then screen printed or did other things on top of it as part of the material that's in it. So you have that, you have offset lithography, traditional lithography, letterpress, screen printing, relief, uh, all kinds of techniques involved here. And on, you know, on this wall is mostly, you know, works by uh, Kerry James Marshall. So, you know, getting, getting back into uh, to, to process, you know, we're looking at a screen printing technique here. So. You have um, a pared down version without any colors, and then this example with the colors added back in. So as Jamal noted. And that's the Mylar. The Mylar. 
for the silks. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you have the mylar of the silk screen here, and you have uh, the colors being introduced in this in this example in this example here. So, just to give um, give you an example of process, and you know how many steps it takes to produce a final image. You know that's you know that's ready to go on view. So, this is more of a behind the scene in the studio. Uh, look at this process. And so the mylar is used to create the screens that we were talking about before. You have the screen, like a window screen mesh of all these different mesh sizes, depending on how much detail you want inside of the room. And so one of this, to me, looks like the, the it's hard to tell the difference, but when you look over here, this gray level right here is, you can see it translated directly inside of here. So when they made this screen, they will only screen this particular cover, color that will overlay on top of everything else. So it's built, the image is built in pieces and not just uh, wholly constructed out of flat colors. Like a lot of these gradients and colors are interacting with each other. So you can see all the different layers that's involved in it. You see the pink, you see the yellow, you see a light blue, a dark blue. This kind of brown might have been created by overlaying an orange color with this gray color to get certain colors. So it's all those different plays and pieces uh, that goes into how many layers is in this screen. I'm not for sure, but it looks like a ton. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> right. Kerry J. Marshall uh, knows what he's doing. So uh, a lot of great layering and fun stuff in this one because you end up with this kind of subtlety up here with the lights. You see a circle and another circle. And then rays are coming. All kinds of interactions are happening with this one. Rarely do you get to see a mylar from a process like this. That's super good. Because again, part of this process when you're doing it, a lot of what we're showing here is, is basically, you almost consider it ephemeral, right? Like just a, a thing that just so happened on the way to making a print. So. The block itself is never the point of doing something, but the block itself can also be beautiful of its own characteristics that we often don't ignore. Well, people like me love it. I love this kind of stuff because you know I'm into printmaking, so it's uh, all this little bits and pieces are always fascinating. And you know, speaking of blocks, you have uh, two examples here, and you know. I, I don't know, I like, uh, you know, works facing each other. So having, you know, some multiple examples in this show was really good for me because uh, I think, you know, this facing off creates another conversation within, you know, the fact that, you know, these are similar techniques with the wood block and, um, you know, providing a, a relief image. And you have uh, this wood block uh, example by Kerry James Marshall, you know, with the text and picture also. Yeah, more more propaganda, right? And this is fascinating because this block feels old. And I think that's what happens with wood. It ages, it has a patina from the use of it. It has other lines in it that were carved, you know, for whatever reason was it. Was it a found piece of wood, you know? Or did it just sit in the closet underneath some stuff? Like, you never know, like, the history that is involved when you look at it. I'll be interested to see the print off of this because it looks like a really great image. And this is a collagraph uh, plate right here to the side. And now when you have a wood block also, and you have a, a really big surface like this, so a work like this, you go in with a similar block here mm -hmm. and you can place your text anywhere. So have you used this approach and just kind of move things around? Oh yeah, with that yeah. Addition? And I think that's the, the beauty of it. That, um, printmaking is done in layers and just like um, I print the way it is over there that has the screens that are arranged in all kinds of different patterns you can do the same thing with something like this because when I look at it I'm looking at I see three distinct pieces involved in it which is the bit color block here this as one and then the type as something else so I feel like those are three different pieces elements each of those elements can be moved around and probably were moved around just to experiment and see what worked, right? Because maybe this block might not have been as big on the first print of years. And Carrie might have been like, you know, maybe it needs a little bit more room, you know, to breathe a little bit. Because it also starts to, when you bring in words and thought bubbles, 
you start to think of comic book panels. Right. And so he was doing uh, comic book related uh, imagery uh, during this time. So maybe that was part of it. You never know. It's like that's the part that you can just think about and debate like to the end of time. Right. And, you know, maybe he has an answer for it somewhere or not. But if you don't know right away, then you know that this color block is shaped almost as a square, but it's cut out here. So that this part of it doesn't have that same color. So the buck balloon stands out just a little bit more than what it was. I would guess that was screen printed on it. You know, and even you know, even you know, place the placement of you, you know, thinking about hair and you know, and also thinking about this conversation about um, I, what I call black Americana and the black experience over here, you have a notion of uh, Afro futurism in the image and you know you have a you know a space like scene a futuristic setting um you have some some updated technology that we don't have yeah the holographic uh image with the children watching it and you also have um this looks like a dogun mask here from uh, molly west africa in this piece is titled uh keeping the culture so you have this future, this Afro-futuristic family uh, setting going on here. And I think the last couple of days we have was Interesting examples of a block and a plate that kind of flow into the conversation around this wall. So a wood block of Dr. King and a plate of uh, Congressman John Lewis. So both civil rights icons and Contributors to you know modern day America. Now, what would you say as a as a printmaker are the big differences in you know using a plate versus a block? Oh, well, for that part was just the process about what are you going to get out of it. You'll get an image. We're using a copper plate, which is what this is. You can see the different ways that acid ate into the plate. So the shiny part was probably covered up and the other part was ate away. And so the ink will stay in the parts that are not shiny. And so all these little parts will be where the image comes from. Uh, so you get a much more uh, pen and ink drawing type of look than with wood blocks is a much more graphic type of look. A lot of solid shapes and stuff like that. Uh, fine details are made by mark making, not by line making, which is a little different. So you get two completely different kind of images like this. And you can look at the, the Mayhew piece uh, that we have around the corner and you can see exactly what I was talking about before. If you ink it up and print it, it looks like one face. But if you roll it up and print it, it's, it looks like completely different because it's a be reverse from where it was intended to be. You want to hit Air's Land and then maybe just kind of close it out with your overall thoughts on the show? Okay. So this piece was another woodblock piece that I printed uh, with the steam roll off a while ago. Uh, air, air to the Land, which I was having a conversation about uh, Drummond Geechee's uh, culture and how much uh, the sense of culture make you who you are. And so inside of her dress is her homeland, her fields, her people and ancestors that are here making it all possible. So it makes you who you are, it's not a separate thing. <laughs> So this was printed uh, in the same way that I, that I printed this other block with a steamroller, but this is on fabric that has been, um, and this fabric has a pattern on it too, because I thought that added a little extra something to it, because you know, you don't want to just make stuff all flat all the time. Like, oh, you know, more different layers of meaning that takes on this kind of really decorative feel from the pose and from the presentation of it that I think is really wonderful. So yeah, um, you know, you know, come see uh, Joy and Resistance, mm -hmm. or Better Days. Come see Better Days, uh, Joy and Revolution. You know, a lot of really great uh, conversations just about uh, you know varying political narratives, uh, Black Americana or the Black experience, and also you know get an introduction to uh, printmaking and a behind the scenes look at different techniques that result in these images. And you get a, a real in-depth view of a lot of different processes. That's why we included a screen printer like Chloe. We included relief printmakers like me. We included Jerusha, who's using 
relief in a completely different way for me. But also you get kind of from the Black Art America collection, you get a lot of different looks into a lot of different processes. Looks that you rarely ever get from seeing like a, a monoprint plate or seeing the mylar from somewhere or seeing the aluminum uh, the litho pick that you have here. Like so much different stuff you never really get a chance to see, but it gives you a perspective and lets you know exactly what you're looking at when you are studying print. So you know where does the value come from when you look at a print. It's not just a thing that was made like <laughs> randomly. Like there was work involved, there's expertise, there's technique that involved in all of it. So it's a brilliant thing. Come and keep, keep having that conversation about what the work means, how it was produced, makes a big difference into entering the conversation. Because I don't think those deleted pieces would be having the same conversation if it was just paint or something like that. Like part of the process adds to the meaning and it's all part of the conversation.